question. Uh, so you were talking how I think from a mathematical perspective, it's really important to be able to show that. But for as long as we get to that part, which one? The very first part where you're able to express mathematically the idea of value. Yeah. You're good to go. I mean, yeah. You don't need to prove. Yeah, I could do my own, right? I could take one and take the first element of C I want, like a null value, and return that as my ev. But if I did that and someone else used my ev, they'd get mad. <laughs> right? Why would they get mad, though? They get mad because it doesn't do ev. So what you said is right as long as you pick the right ev. And this tells you what the right ev is. It's, it's telling you what ev is supposed to do. Now, it might not be clear that it's doing that, but it completely determines this object. This function object is not an implementation. It is an idea. It's the idea of function. And this expresses what that... It doesn't look like it because you're not used to this language. But by the time... Like, if you, if you liked to work, work for this language, you would see that that's, that is what a function object is. It's a thing that I can take something and evaluate on it. Distance from CV that you create will be will be you can track it and therefore compose it in that in that final in that final uh, statement there. But that's just saying that the world is consistent, right? That, that you picked you a good move, ev. You move your function. You yeah. Move your function uh, that the world will move with you, kind of thing, like in a way that you can track. Here's what. Okay. How about the, um, hmm. so uh, suppose that everyone in this room assigns to each person in this room. You assign um, a function from other people in this room to colors. So uh, how, how, actually, just everyone in the front row takes the time to say, for everyone in here, I can give them a color. Then they are giving a function from people to colors. Um, they are this thing that takes a person, and they're, for each person in the front row, given a person and a person in the front row, there's a color. That x will map uniquely to the set of all functions from people to colors. This might be too. Does that make sense? So, yeah. OK. Real quick, what's yeah. a little like st or whatever have? Oh, such that. Oh, OK. But if I just think it's a universal consistency, it's, it's going to be universally consistent. That's, that's not good. What we're doing here isn't going to be different than what you would do yeah. elsewhere. If you satisfy this universal property, then you are the same as, and I, I do too, then we're in bijection, meaning there is a way to go back and forth. Well, that means that, like, one person was saying, what is math good for in the real world? And they, and they said, I like this because they said, it's for communication at scale. So you have, in this room, we can come up with any Creole we want, right? We can come up with some language where we're all agreeing that ST means a bear or something. I don't know. <laughs> and, and that's like how, what we mean. Whenever we say ST, we mean a bear. But that's not going to be like at scale. That's not going to work with anybody else. And my ev function, if it's a really crappy one, is not going to work right. You're not, it's not going to work with other people. So this is for communication at scale because, because if we're all using this universal property, we know we mean the same thing. So it's not about implementation or what I think this ev should be. It is the only ev that works. And the only, this, this set C to the B is the only one that works. Um, so take, let's say C is a one, two, three. And my, my thing from B times C to the B to C sends B comma F to two. I take a B, I take a function, and I give two. That's not a good ev. That, that is, uh, this, I can take C to the B as my x, and that can be a perfectly good f, or maybe I should call this thing E for evaluation. That can be a perfectly good evaluation. And from that evaluation, I can get a function object or like a, um, a function from B to C, namely the function that returns 2 for everything. But it is not ev. It's a constant, but it's also, I mean, I could just take a random, I mean, I could, I could set a seed and pick a random function and have that be my ev for all time. And that's not a good ev. 
except when it is like 99% of the time the answer right. is two and then there's those weird cases where the answer is three and you didn't cover those right so you think you have a good ev and you don't right yeah. this guarantees it's a good ev um, yeah. Does this define the universal, or this universal property? Does it define the exponential, or does it define ev, or does it define both? It defines both. Just like so, for um, products, it's not just this pair type, because what if you implemented this in a really weird way? It's the w it's the pair type together with first and second okay. that defines. Um, there, in fact, is well, yeah, I'm not going to go there. So it's this triple. That is the data of the product. Yeah. When you say that's not a good app, yeah. The bottom line here. Is that because it essentially ignores what app is? What what is? It ignores the if it's if it's applying a function um, in a B and it just decides to return two two, then it's ignoring the function that's passed to it, yep, and the and the B. It's ignoring everything. Or it could take them into account, and it could like do some random thing, right? I could do the ev, and then I could add one, right, mod three, and get something. That's also not the right ev, because it's not going to compose right with other. Yeah. So um, it ignores it, but it also just doesn't do the right thing. And what it means to do the right thing is, is that. <laughs> Yeah. So when you say it's not the right ev. It's not the one that does this. And there's no reason to call it ev if ev stands for evaluate. Right. It but could be Eve's special function or like, you're right. It, it could be a good name, but it's not mine. Yeah. Okay. So, but is it saying, are you saying also that the property would not hold? Yes. Okay. The property would not hold. Any time that property holds, <coughs> b to the c or c to the b, is bijective with whatever thing you made it hold for. So if you made some other thing and called it um, arrow type BC, and you made an evaluation function, took an arrow type BC and, and a B and returned to C, then I know I can get a map from yours to mine, your arrow type to what I call exponential object, and a map from mine to yours. And I'm going to get those two maps by using this universal property. I'm going to get I'm going to get the queue from your version to mine, and I'm going to get the queue from my version to yours. And I know that if I do the round trip, I'm going to be able to, um, I'm going to come back where I started from. So these universal properties guarantee that anything that fits in this place that actually did work would be the same or bijective with um, my choice, uh, isomorphic to my choice. Yeah. So that top left arrow going from B cross X to B cross uh, CB. Yeah. I wrote B times Q. Oh. What it more like should be is identity on B times Q. Right. And, and, and then you can get even more specific what it really means, some kind of pair of like a projection followed by identity, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. This times here? So we're coming from a, a mapping with B and X coordinates Right. What this notation means, and it has real meaning in some, after the third three hour block, two hour block, this will mean something. What it means right now, it's just shorthand for take my B coordinate and don't do anything to it. Like do the identity function on B and pair that with Q. So take my BX, return the same B, and then, oops and Q the other side. So if I have a B, you have, you have an evaluation function, and I do too. Given a B and yours, you can get a C. Um, given a B, you can also take your X and turn it into my evaluation function, or my function type. And yeah, it's too many words. Um, yeah, don't do anything with a B. One of the issues with domain would be the C, the C uh, is one, two, three, and, and your function only covers two. So is that like a quick diagnostic of that that's not consistent? 
range? Yeah. Range yeah. The number of diagnostics you have to write, run is probably like C to the B times B many choices to finish it. But um, I guess that'd be like a test, <laughs> one test. Um, yeah. Yeah, we can falsify it pretty quickly if we know how, if we, if we have intuition. Um, to make sure I understand this, so this is... I oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I should read this as an element from the set, from the category B. Uh, Ev? To, uh, sorry, but the, the B times that, B times Q to B times X to, goes to B times C. That times is one element of B, not the category B. This guy here? With Q. Yeah. This is um, this is notation, um, so I'll put it in quotes. Um, it's it's actually probably better to write it this way, and it's um, it's for taking pair types to pair types. So okay. if I have a to a prime and b to b to prime, and I have f and g, then this notation f times g goes from pair a b to pair a prime. Oops, A prime, B prime. Run F on the left side and G on the right side in parallel. Okay. So my clock says I have 40 seconds left. So, um, so. If anybody wants to talk about this stuff, this is maybe where a little group can kind of discuss. Because, like, I know I get this because I've already struggled through this part. You know, so if anybody wants to talk later about it, you know, grab me or grab somebody else. Yeah. So uh, let's take a five minute break. And do whatever you want, and then we'll be back. <laughs> Almost. I want to just wrap my head around this one. Okay. Yeah, I'm just struggling. So what happens? I was just like trying to convince myself that the cardinality of these two values of like B with the cross B and C and how to see B, and then like I started to have them, and I like, like never quite caught up. Yeah. It's yeah. like it's like literally. What do you call it? Universal properties? It's because uh, for all. Um. It's this form for all exists unique. Okay, this is a combination that means universal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, in fact, um, the empty set, say, there's a unique map from it to A. So the for all is vacuous. Yeah. There exists a unique map from empty set to A. So even that very first thing I talked about was a universal property. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even though know, this is right. Okay. Yeah, because I don't know what to look for when you say universal property. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. I heard you talk about something like way earlier. Okay. Do you want to finish this Yeah, sure enough. So, like, I Equal. I actually meant two to the three, the number eight. Yeah. Underlined. Okay, okay this is a set, right? Let's see a set. Taking the exponential of a set, what exactly is that? No, this is not a set. Okay, a set. sorry. Okay. Um, eight is a number. Oh, sorry. This, this, the entire underline of this. It was, it, was ambi it was ambiguous as written, although I tried to correct it later. Sorry, I missed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you see this statement. Right, yes. Okay. Okay, got it. So I have function okay. one, two, three, all the way through eight, yeah. each of which gives a function from three to two. Right, right. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> this guy here. Like, um, is it right to say that. Um, Sorry, did you want to take a break? Or? Uh, no, go ahead. Yeah, okay. I'm going to erase those and stuff. Okay, yeah. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I kind of. So this is like the whole reason why we study exponentials is because we have observed that there is exists some sort of abstract set of things which match this 
because universal property, and therefore we're trying to draw conclusions about this universal property. And it so happens that functions in the programming sense are exponential. Function type. Function type. And one of your functions from B to C. Okay. Okay. Sure. Okay, let's start in two minutes. Two? Yeah. Well, struggling with the size of the notation. The what notation? The size of the notation. It's too small? Yeah. Look, somebody else said it. I have pretty good eyes. Um, so if it could just be a little bigger. I'll try, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Like the first way I could do it is I could have this function and my X run to it. Okay. Actually, let's let's. It's running. It's running. Okay, let's. Yeah, let me know. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. It's 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 it just it just kind of gel. I see. Like I don't know what your X is, but if you can still give me a C from it, and the point is, if I can put this shit like together. That, and, like, you're good. Like hey, if you right. call it a foo foo foo, but yeah. it acts like that. Okay. 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 Yeah. Thanks. Don't get too frustrated. People don't get it because some people no, won't. But like, oh man, it's so awesome. Like seeing this stuff. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm probably gonna start, but cry. Okay, all right. Yeah. And then now, if I have B crossed with index, I have. In 43 minutes. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's talk about what a category is in the abstract. What is all the stuff I just said about sets, and where can you ask all those questions and do all that stuff in a general abstract setting? So, so uh, it's a mathematical object. So a category, so let's def write def. A category C, that might look like an E, but it's supposed to be a script C, um, consists of some stuff. So what's the data type of category. One, it has a set. Some people will say it's a class, but no one knows what a class is. Well, some people do. But it's just a set. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a classroom of objects. It's a set of objects. No, a set. Sorry, it's a set. Ob C. That's the name of the set. And the elements of that set are called objects. I really don't like when people say it's a set of objects because what's an object? What they mean is it's a set where the elements are called, where each element is called an object. Some people write class. It just means like a s yeah, a bunch. Okay, for every two sets, for every two for every two objects, for every C and D in ob C, um, you also get a set called hom C C D elements of which is called elements of which are called. Um, morphisms or homomorphisms and we might write if f is an element of hom cd um, we write f taking c to d or c d f three um, for every c 
for every object a choice. This weird sentence structure is because I said it consists of for everything a choice, right? A choice uh, um, that's going to be called IDC in HOM CC. called the identity, and for, for a function, well, for every f in hom cd and g in hom de, an element f composed g in hom C, E. Okay, so let me try to relate this to sets again. In sets, we have C equals set. Let me make some space, actually. You might want to make, if you're taking notes, which you really don't have to do, because there's lots of textbooks on this, so try not to take notes that are complete, as complete as a textbook, um, because you can do that later. Try to, I think, at least myself, I prefer to try to make sure I understand everything as it's being said, so I have questions ready. Um, if you won't say it, I'll say it. Your, your textbook is really good. Really, oh. It drives home, of all the category three books out there, it gets as close as possible to the quotation. It talks about monads and a whole bunch of great stuff. Um, so I, if you won't say it, I'll say it. Thanks. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Are, are there are also functions between the home sets? No. <laughs> well, I mean, um, no. Oh, okay, I see. No. So in the category of sets, the one is, um, it's the class or the set of all sets. So ob set is the set of all sets. That's not a set, because it's too big. And so there's something called universes, where it controls for all that, and you don't have to worry about it. It's really a technicality that it, you're going to be way beyond this material if you're ever encountering that, that technicality. So it's a set of all sets. There is a set of all sets. It's just that it's a different size set than the sets in it. <laughs> OK. B, hom CD. Well, I already defined that notation, so it's the same notation as before. It's a set of all functions from C to D. Three, the identity I defined before. <coughs> and four, um, composition as defined before. I don't even know why, why I'm writing this. Uh, so there. That's how this is the category of sets was one of these things. But Hask, Hask, the category of data types and programs in Haskell, is modeled on or is close to being a category. Someone, there's a page where you can see all the exceptions and everything's wrong. It's not at all a category. It's nothing like it. There's no reason to do anything. Um, but no, it's close. It's close to this. So the objects there are data types, int string, bool, int time string. For every two data types, there is a set of programs, there is a type of programs from C to D, actually a set of programs from C to D. Um, every, pro every data type has a program that returns self, and whenever you have a program from C to D and a program from D to E, you can get a program from C to E by composing, and so Hask is basically a, I'm going to pretend Hask is a category, yeah. I'm confused about, about point two. Um, so we're talking about this set. Uh, um, CD. Uh, are you saying that that set must exist and be not empty, or you're saying no? It that could be empty. If it exists, the elements are, are would, would, would um, be in order to give a category. I will provide you with this set. You'll provide it. Okay. Yep. So my, so, okay. Someone cannot claim to have a category unless they've given you this data for any CD. Okay. Right. It's the claim they're making when they tell you they have a category. Okay. They're also they making all of the maps. Yep. The yep. The denotation, like what it would be to be a map, is good enough. You just have, a, have to have like an abstract set, meaning like an understanding of what's in the set and what's not in the set. You don't have to be able to produce them, like put a table full of them all, right? 
Um, but when someone says they have a category, they don't just give you this bunch of stuff. They have to make it satisfy some properties. And that is um, for any C and D and function from C to D. So this thing is an element of the HOMF set CD. I've already said that notation, but I wanted to write it again for some reason. Um, if I do identity on C and compose that with F, it's equal to F. If they don't satisfy that rule, they haven't given you a category. And if they don't satisfy the rule that if they do F and then identity on D, that fixes what identity means. It's not an implementation thing about self. It's that that's um, that their, their notion of composition, their notion of identity works right together in this sense. And for any um, C to D called F, D to E called G, and uh oh, for any B to C, G, H, B to C, C to D, D to E, if they do F compose G, they get a new map, for, uh, they get a new morphism from B to D, which they could then compose with H. And that's the same thing as doing F and then composing with G circle H, this G H. All that means is you don't even have to write the parentheses. You can just write lists of compositions and it's unambiguous. And that's it. Now you've got a category. If someone satisfies all that stuff, they've given you a category. And there's tons of them um, besides set. And besides task. Yep. Every every object has to have an identity arrow chosen in advance. And anytime you have three arrows in a row, it doesn't matter how you compose them, they give the same answer. Associativity. This is often called unital. If the, cat, the, the stuff you've got is unital, and this is called associative. Identity is a unit. Morphism. Yeah, and that's always what a category is. So let's talk about um, your question from earlier where I said that makes no sense, but it makes perfect sense. So take this set. This set has three elements, <coughs> A, B, C. I'm going to make a category, make a category where the objects, I'll call it C, Objects of C is the set ABC. I said you had to give a set, and that's my set. HOM in C from anything to anything, whether it's A or B or C, is this is cases notation. Cases, not set notation. Cases. If X equals Y, give me the, ter the star set. Just star. Doesn't mean anything. It's just star. Uh, no, no, no. I'm going to call it identity sub x. And it's just the name of an element. I should probably call it star, but I should probably call it identity sub x. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so what this says is, this is a category, and it has three objects. And the morphisms from A to B is empty. There's none. There's no morphism from B to C and no morphism from C to A. But there is an identity arrow in everything because they need it. They need it to be a category. And if I compose the identity with itself, well, I only have one choice of what morphism from A to A that could be. It has to be identity. So it's going to work with this thing, and it's going to work with this thing, because if I do identity three times, it doesn't matter if I, which way I composed it. So here's a little category called a discrete category. <coughs> it's discrete because for every two objects, The set of maps between them is either the identity, if it's the same two objects, if it's the same object, or empty set. It's a discrete category you can assign to any set. It satisfies all the rules. It just doesn't look anything like Hask. It's Hask where every data type has only identity function and there's no programs. It's not a very good programming language. Um, but it's a category. It's really, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a li expressive power versus like computational. Um, so, so any any set 
can be regarded, in French, regard means to look at, I don't know, looked at as, um, as a discrete category. You can kind of change your viewpoint on it and see a discrete category sitting there. It's a set until you call it a discrete category and soon we'll have like the category of discrete categories and there'll be a functor from this, from sets to discrete categories and like you don't have, this regarding is a functor but right now it's just a view change of, it's just an analogy. Um, what does discrete mean? It means that for any two things, there's no map between them unless it's the same thing and you're required to have one. So that's the unique discrete category on those Yeah. Any post set. Any post set. Can you explain what a post set is? Yeah. Can be regarded as a category. Where, where, okay, so what's a post set? A po is it valuable? Because I keep hearing post set, but I don't know why it's valuable. Why is it valuable? Um, security protocols, I don't know. Like uh, clearance. So which clear, uh, what clearance level are you? So this guy, there's a clearance, there's a clearance level, there's a clearance, there's there, and there. So if I'm level five clearance, then I'm also level four, three, and two. Yep. And one. Partially ordered set. That's it's a partially ordered set. That's what PO stands for. Uh, Oops. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's the property of this thing? I drew arrows everywhere. There to tell you who's got more priority. Or maybe less. Like maybe this guy. Whatever. Um, so, right. A post set is a set. A post set. It might be written like this. Here's the data structure you need, if I'm using that word right. So where, where P is a set and less than is um, a relation. Do you guys know what that is? A relation, meaning, as ugly as it is, that less than is a subset of P times P. Meaning you can say whether one thing is less than another. <coughs> and it has to satisfy two rules that um, A is less than or equal to itself for all A, or P, for all elements of the post set. A is less than itself. That's called being reflexive. So if I have, if it's about who has more priority or whatever, I have at least as much priority as myself. And um, if A is less than or equal to B, which is less than or equal to C, then A is less than or equal to C. Like I can, um, that's, transitive. that's transitive. B is less than or equal to C, then A is less than or equal to C. I think someone asked me to write bigger and I haven't been doing that, so sorry so about that. So it's not like a directed acyclic graph? Um, um, no, maybe. Well, so in a directed acyclic graph, you're allowed to have two arrows from A to B, like this. So if you are, then it's a restriction on directed acyclic graphs. Okay, so also, okay. no, in fact, yeah. There's a third property that people often add that, I don't, that you don't have to add, which is that if A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to A, then A and B are equal. So we're allowed to have, without that restriction, you're allowed to have this. A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to A. What's that restriction called? Is that part it's of called anti-symmetric, I think. Uh, it, now, is that part of a post set or is that a different thing? I think it's typically part of the definition. But I allied the difference because as categories, they're equivalent. And I think it's a little bit, uh, I don't know. Wait, it's, yeah, would, wouldn't also a post set be cyclic just by, by the reflexive property of it? Doesn't that build in a cycle into every element in this? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, good point. So it's how can you regard a post set as a category. Oh, whoops. Um, the objects of the category are the elements of P. So here are all the objects of my category. The morphisms from one thing to another thing are 
there is an empty set of morphisms if there's no path. And there's a one element set of morphisms if there's a path. So it's just a question, is there a path from A to B? If so, put a morphism. If not, don't put a morphism. And this says that everything has an identity morphism. There's a path from A to itself. And the transitivity says you can compose them. So a post set, it's actually called a pre-order if you... So a post set is different from a pre-order. Yeah, and I'm not saying the difference. And I can't tell if that's going to make things worse or not. But <laughs> um, can be regarded oops, as a category. Do you mind if it's like pre-orders and post sets? When you get into them, like, they're actually, for programming, they're really applicable. But it's kind of hard to really kind of grok it with that. So if it will take you less than a minute, can you say the difference between a post set and a pre-order? Yeah, a pre-order, a post set is a pre-order. A pre-order. P less than, such that A less than or equal to B and B less than or equal to A implies A equals B. Oh, so post set is a pre-order. Got it. With an extra property. With that extra constraint. Right. Whereas for me, if I have this, then I, that means I have a map from A to B and a map from B to A. Um, and that means I have a map from A to itself when I compose them. And that there's only one map from A to itself, namely the identity. So it's actually, this is an isomorphism. So it's just a pre-order is like a post set, except where equals has been re replaced by isomorphic. It's a slight relaxation on a, pre on a post set. Uh, yeah. So they're not equal, but they're isomorphic. They're isomorphic. They're two bars, but they're three bars. Yeah. So it's a very minor difference. If you re think about isomorphism as a pretty minor difference, That's cool. then it's just saying that if, if um, I have two names for the same priority, or what I call it, privilege class, or... Um, security clearance class. I have this class and this class, and this one's less than that one, and that one's less than this one. This one can see anything, that one can see, that one can see anything. This, they're still distinct. One's called the A class, one's called the B. But there's no semantic, there's no real important difference. So a pre-order is just one where you're allowed to have this. Yeah. It's a re relaxation that's actually nicer from a category theoretic perspective. A category. Um, saying that a post set is a good program where, or like you've done it well, where you, you don't you don't ever have duplication. There's only one of them. Yeah. But a pre-order is like, well, actually, we kind of made them. <laughs> they're actually like the same role. Yeah. But, but don't worry, I've got it all under control. I know what. Yeah. Okay. Hum in C from A to B has at most one element. Dude, you got pre-order, man. It's not post set. Okay. So. Hum A to B means I'm going to write a map from A to B, but there, I don't have to label it with anything because there's only one. If there is one, there's only one. So it's a category where you don't need to label your arrows. There's only one program from A to B, and it's not really a program. It just says I can return a B type if I have an A type in exactly one way. And so um, in, in that case, you would write A less than B. So you take any category you want, and you find out that for every two objects, if you look into the HOM set between them, all the mappings, there's either none or there's one. Then you can replace that idea of mapping with the notion of less than, and you get a pre-order. And all pre-orders come to you that way. So there are all these little graphs where if there's two paths from A to B, they're, they're, you can think of them as the same. Like this clearance is less than this one, which is less than this one. This clearance is less than this one, which is less than this one. It's just less than this. I don't know. I don't know what a thin category is. Um, oh, I didn't start my timer. Holy God. Okay, 20 minutes. Okay. I had a break for talking to your neighbor. Is it a good, do you guys want one? Okay, okay, go ahead. So ask, find out what's going on. Yeah, we already talked about ourselves. So the question is, in uh, our field, 
uh, there's a crisis of defining equality, and then we've got lots of people like in the chromatoma type theory world like working on this problem, and I don't keep up. So in the context of what you're talking about, so, uh, Vincent just made a comment, the category theory speaking in terms of isomorphism, not equality, but we're using the equal signs rather than like liberally, and even in... I use them liberally? Well, oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I feel yeah, like yeah. there are equal signs. Yeah, I'm, I'm pro... I, yeah. No, that's fine. But, you know, it's possible that a category has an equal concept inside of that category. But when we're talking about the category theory, we're kind of looking to see where... The, the isomorphism is the important a, is important not idea, not the equals. Right, okay. And in fact, any definition that uses equals rather than isomorphism is called by some people evil. Oh, good, 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 good. Okay. So if you look at the term evil in category theory, uh -huh. that actually has a technical, some semi-technical definition, which means using equals when you're supposed to be using, using equals, leaning too hard on equals. Oh, that's evil in category theory. Yeah. Okay. No equals, right? Yeah, you can do equals, but it's being evil. It's not with the spirit of category theory, and it's not usually going to work quite right. Can you specify what equality means just in category theory? I don't think so. So when in the definition of it's part of what a set needs to be able to say what equals is. That's what a set does. So, so, when, so this actually is a very very basic question. When we define a category, we define the most basic terms, irrespective of the examples or any example category. Yeah. Now we have to say what associativity is. So we have to define associativity over these morphisms. Yep. And you know, to a layman, you might want a two category. A two category is one where these equals between the morphisms become isomorphisms. Become isomorphisms. Yeah, okay, that's okay. what you actually want is isomorphisms. Now you're okay. in called two category world. Okay. But then there's going to be an equal sign waiting for you a little later. Oh, okay. And infinity categories or homotopy type theory, etc., uh -huh. are when they're just isomorphisms all the way down. Okay, okay, okay. I'm beginning to understand. So, but we're 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 allowing ourselves to use equal sign for now. Yeah. The definition. Yeah. Of the, the definition of the category. Yeah. Just to keep it simple. Yeah. Right. So we're being evil. A little bit. Okay. Yeah. Okay, 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 yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'm saying somehow. Yeah. Oh, and so oh, and so I so I probably need so probably need self whatever. And then, right. I just thought I just could be Yeah. Hey, I just uh, got accepted to course 16. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I've got a graduate level math requirement that I was I don't teach. You don't teach? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but you should ask the math department to teach a category theory class because it's ridiculous that they don't. Okay. <laughs> but don't tell them I said that because... David said that. <laughs> well, I think it, I do think it's ridiculous that they don't. Right. Okay. Cool. I think it's a service course for the rest of the... I think there, there's a lot of people who would want a category theory class. Uh, yeah. And it's ridiculous that they don't teach it as a service course because it's becoming very popular. I see. Okay. So, yeah. Cool. Well, so but sure. write me an email yeah, if so you have any questions. Great. Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, start back up again. Okay, so any lingering questions? Quick ones? Lingering question? Yeah. So, you remember before whenever you had three dots on one side, two dots on the other side, and you said then you ended up with two to the power of three? To me, maybe I'm not understanding, but I thought of it as. Like two, 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 which would be six. So I, I didn't fully understand how we actually got to the power of three. There. Okay, that's yeah. So uh, I don't want to answer that right now because it will break the flow. Oops. But but no, it's a good question, and um, I think what you were doing is eight times. Well, I guess I'll answer it. Eight times b. <laughs> that oops bothered me too. So eight times b is um, pairing an a and a b, and that would have six elements. Choose one of these. Choose one of these. And what I wanted is for each of these, choose one of those. So I don't know if you know cock or dependent types or anything. No? OK, sorry. <laughs> it's like a pi type. It's, um, it's a dependent product. And it says a function type is for every A, give me a B. 
So for every dot over here, give me a dot over there. And that's, that's um, so what are they? Okay. I just, I just have to do more than six, right? So there's this one, there's this one, there's this one, there's this one, there's eight. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Sure. Any monoid. So what are we doing right now? We're talking about categories. And we said set is a category. And that's like the quintessential category. It's got a bunch of sets. Those are the objects. It's got morphisms. Those are the functions. And you can compose and their identities. And once you have a category, you can ask questions like, what is the initial object? In set, it's a thing that maps one way to anything. In set, we have, I haven't said this part, sorry. In set, there is exactly one map from the empty set to anything, so it's called the initial object. In any category, you can say, is there an initial object or not? And um, in some post sets, there might be an initial object, like this one, but there's no terminal object in this category because there's nothing that everybody maps to uniquely. This guy does not map to this one, this one does not map to this one, so there's no terminal object. But you can ask whether there is or not, and if there was, it would look kind of like a diamond, right? So um, you can ask whether your post set has a terminal or initial object because it's a category. And in any category, you can ask the question, what is the HOM set from the, this to this? What is, the, is there an initial object? Is there a terminal object? Are there products in this category? Are there coproducts? And a, a, a post set will have coproducts if it has joins. I'm going to talk quickly, so anyone who doesn't understand, ask me later. And a, a, product, a post set will have um, products if it has meets, if you can take two things and find something mapping to both of them, under both. And so all the usual ideas of join and meet, and and or, these types of things, and and or, become coproduct, or product and coproduct in a post set. And so there's all sorts of like common ideas that you've heard before, things you've heard before in, in and and or, in logic, that have a correlate inside of their category theoretic world in terms of products and coproducts. So that's what category theory is good for, is what's the real idea here? What's product mean? It's not implementation of pairs. It's this universal property that and satisfies. Um, and then I started saying any pre-order, any pre-order is a category. And that's like if you have a set S, then the power set of S, meaning the set of all subsets of S, is a pre-order. So uh, I'm kind of losing my direction, my sense of direction here. But let's say you have three element set, and that's S. Then there's this post set where you have the empty set, you have just A, you have just B, you have just C, you have AB, you have BC, and you have AC, and you have ABC. And there's a pre-order there. Oops. And this pre-order has an initial object and a terminal object when you regard it as a category. These are the objects of the category. There's eight. And the arrows are the morphisms. But I don't think of the, map, the two maps from B to ABC going in different paths as different morphisms. They're the same morphism, which means there's exactly one morphism from here to here. And in fact, for any two elements, there's either zero or one ah, morphism. So this is a post set, it's also a category. It has an initial object and a terminal object. And the or will be what's called, will turn into the coproduct. And the and will turn into the product. And uh, and means intersection, or means union kind of thing. So all these different ideas, to me, they're all the same. To you, they might be different, I, I don't know. But you can see that this symbol looks a little bit like this symbol. Um, and this symbol looks a little bit like this symbol. And they're all like meaning the same thing category theoretically. And and or, union and, and intersection. And so what I'm saying is if you regard a post set or pre-order, whether it's a power set of subsets or any other thing as a category, you can ask the same kinds of questions. So lots of different parts of mathematics fit into this category idea, and a monoid does too. So it can be regarded as a category. But you might not know what a monoid is. So let me say what a monoid is. A monoid is a set where you can multiply, or add, or 
there's a one operation and there's an identity. So it's, um, what is a monoid? A monoid is a set M to get, well, consists of You don't have to start at A, right? You can start at B. B, a set M, C, a f um, an element, E, and D, a function, oops, I'm going to start at 2. <laughs> a function called times, taking M cross M to M such that A, um, E times M equals M equals M times E, and B, M times N times P equals M times N times P. So it's a lot of abstract nonsense up there, a lot of stuff. What is all this stuff saying? So the natural numbers are a monoid. The natural numbers with 0 and plus, where this is the number 2, this is number 3, and this is number 4, forms a monoid. It means you have a set, you know how to do something to pairs of elements, you know how to multiply them or add them, and you know a specific element, such that when you add with 0, you get back where you started, and um, on, e on either side, and, and where plus is associative. So there's another one, namely, um, Types, well, there's types with times and unit. So given type, given two types, you can multiply them and get a pair type. There's a unit type, and if you multiply with a unit, you get back where you started. This is a little bit like um, kinda. And it's kinda because you need a, like, is, is int times unit exactly equal to int, or is it just isomorphic? Um, the kinda is, is that problem. But this one's real, and there's lots and lots of monoids. Um, here's a better one, like list A, with the empty list, and is it called, con no, append? That's a monoid. So these are monoids. Um, and the reason I wrote starting at two is that these are going to be categories, and the category is, so ob m is going to be our favorite one element set. So imagine you had a category with just one object. So there's your category, and it has, but it has lots, it has lots of maps from m to itself. So hom in m from the one object so the one object is M. The elements of M, the natural numbers, the types, the so list A, are thought of, strangely, as maps from star, to, from star to star. And, oof, I'm going to call it smiley, because I already used star from something else. So if you know how to multiply elements, what you can think of that as is traversing a path through this thing that says, like, if I do 2 and then I do 3, maybe that's the same thing as doing 5. So the composition law, so um, M circle N, the composition of, of this thing and that thing is M times N from the monoid. That makes sense. So sorry, the, the member of the, the object in the category is the operation. No, the ob object in the category is like some stupid object. It's like I can I can like act on myself like in a bunch of different ways, but it's just me becoming a new me. And when I when I do one thing and then another thing, like um, that's the same thing as you know I can compose maps for myself to myself. So imagine a paint program. You have the canvas, that's your one element. And you can do things. So you have all the operations M. Those are ways of taking the canvas, 
and getting the canvas back. It's just that you've changed the canvas. So if I, if I uh, do make a cir circle and then I make a square, that's the same thing as making a square and then making a circle. So I can compose operations on my paint canvas over and over. Or I can take two lists and co append them and then append another one and append another one. And doing that is an associative, like if you, the reason I started with two is that this is the HOM set, M. The one, L, like the one is empty, it's vacuous in some sense. There is only one object in this category. The third thing I mentioned was the identity element, which is the do nothing. So there's an, if you had an, if you did take notes, which I told you not to do, uh, then you would notice that this, <laughs> that this was in one-to-one -one correspondence with the old way of, like with, with what a category is. It should have been right here, but I erased it. Can I give another example that, uh, about this that from programmers, I think they were like, oh wow, because list is one where if you put list together, you have a list, it's a list. But if I put another list, what do I got? A list. I put another list, what do I got? A list. But there's another one, which is servers. If you think about servers are the objects, where, and the operation is load balancing them. So I have a server, that thing can do computation. But if I now take a server and a server, and I, the operation is put them underneath a load balancer, add it to your load balancer, technically, what do I still have? I still have a computational unit that acts as if it's just one thing. But then I can add another one to the load balancer. What do I have? I still basically have a computational unit. Then okay. I can add a load balancer on top okay, of that. Okay, let, me, let me take it back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess when we're talking about um, the category, the monoid category. Yeah. Um, the monoid as a category, yep. As a category. Are, you, are we only taking um, associative, uh, uh, I guess, um, a, a monoid has to satisfy an associative law, which when you think of these elements of the monoid as morphisms, turn into, turns into the associative law I required for categories. So in other words, um, what I'm all saying here is a monoid is or can, a category with one object. If you have any category with one object, I can turn into a monoid. If you have any monoid, I can turn into a category with one object, and that round trips to, so, to identity. Wait, if we have, uh, or to isomorphism. If we have like an integer, right? There's all kinds of morphisms from integer to integer um, in, in the past. But if you want to look at And you that, can compose those, right? Yeah, yeah, we can compose those. So that's a monoid. For any type in a programming language, pick all the maps from it to itself. All the maps from int to int. There will, you're going to have a set of them, or a type of them. You're going to have an identity element in there. You're going to be able to take two of them and compose them, FG. It's not going to be commutative, but I never said it had to be. So FG is not GF. But it is true that if you do the self followed by your identity followed by M, you get M. And if you compose them in any order. So for any type of programming language, there's, an, there's a monoid sitting there. It's a category with one object. And I have two minutes, so let me just um, Say one last thing. If you have any graph, so that's just a bunch of d dots and arrows, then you can think of all of the elements of that thing, all the dots as objects, all the arrows as morphisms, but in fact, all the paths as morphisms. So there's a path from this guy to this guy, namely FG. There's a path from this guy to this guy, namely HI. Every arrow is a path. And the, em the path that starts at a node but doesn't go anywhere is also a path. It's the zero length path. And so if you take paths in a graph, is a category. And it's called the free category on that graph. So categories arise from graphs if you're interested in the paths through those graphs. Those, the paths through a graph are a category, and they're called the free category. And a finally presented category says, here's my, <clears throat> here's my graph, but F followed by G, to me that's exactly the same as H followed by I in my semantics. I guarantee you that. Once you do that, the HOM set from this dot to this dot regards these two as the same element. And so finally presented categories and databases have a lot in common. I'm not going to say much about that, but I've, there are videos online about that, and we have a company that does that at which, with open source software. So um, if you're interested in algebraic databases, like there's a talk tomorrow, uh, about algebraic databases. I'm going to come back to it a little bit, but there's a way of thinking about databases, you know, tables full of data, in terms of finitely presented categories. 
And um, they're just kind of a very nice way of making a connection between categories and, and, um, and computer science. So, for example, in this guy, um, in a monoid, I can just write down all the elements of the monoid, and then I can say which ones equal which ones. And when I do that, I'm saying, here are my generating arrows for my category, and then I'm saying which paths are the same. Like, 3 followed by 5 is the same as 8, or is the same as 2 followed by 6. So I don't know if that's helpful, but um, I think we should stop. And um, I'm available for questions so afterwards. So.